Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. And we're in your hymnals now, starting on page 194. Now, ultimately, we're going to get to page 212 and the text, Most Dangerous Game, which many freshmen consider probably their favorite texts from the freshman year. We're obviously going to ask why that's the case. When I lecture seniors, I often will reference this text, Most Dangerous Game, and it's one of the only stories in the senior year that seniors can remember from their freshman year. Again, we're maybe going to ask, why is that the case that this, it's really a long story, this long story is almost never considered by freshmen to be a boring story. We're going to ask maybe why that's the case. However, before we get there, let's say two things quickly for your notes. One, the first thing we want to say is that we are now moving out of Unit 1 into Unit 2, which is designated as all short stories. So let's write that down. When we're in Unit 2, we're now going to be reading short stories. Number two, before we get to the first text of Unit 2, Most Dangerous Game, we have some introductory pages that I want you to have at least looked at. I'm starting with you now on page 194. Look at it uh, with me. The big question is the first thing we want to write down. If the big question in Unit 1 was, does truth change? The big question of Unit 2 is, is conflict necessary or inevitable? Okay? Now this will be a question for us that we're going to come back to over and over again, so I want it in your notes. Number 2. You'll notice that we've got some big question vocabulary on page 195. I want you to take a look at these words on 195, and I want you to feel confident that you know them. On page 196 and 197, elements of a short story, we've already talked about all of the things in bold, but all of them should be listed at, two, uh, at 2B for you so that you have some sense of what it is that you're looking at. By the way, just to point out, we talked in earlier lectures about the plot hill, and we'll obviously speak of it again, but notice on 197 that it's not that plot uh, diagram is not in the form of a hill, but rather in the form of a flow chart. I really don't care how you look at it as long as you know those elements of exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and then of course the resolution of the denouement. By the way, I've been using that word denouement. There it is on page 197 in the last box. Do you see it at number five? So if you need a spelling of that word on 197, there it is for you. We also will focus on character, although we've been doing this already in our earlier lectures, for example, when we were looking at Uncle Marcos. But now on page 198, we're going to give some uh, more analyzation of uh, analyzing of characters, also analyzing of structure and theme on page 199. Again, we've already done that. They're going to give you a close read of the elements of short story on page 200 and 201, and following 203, uh, we've got another story. I'd like you to at least take a look at that and to be familiar with that, but I'm not going to spend any time with that because I'm now ready to turn to the text of our study, and that is page 210 to 11, Most Dangerous Game and American History. Now, on page 210, point out for yourself right away, we're going to look now at two stories together, as we've pointed out in earlier lectures. Your textbook company likes to put a couple of stories together. So we're going to study now two stories in unison, but we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about how these texts are similar, obviously after we do the second text, American History. Our first text then will be the most dangerous game. I want to jump to 2B quickly. Let's get there. We are going to focus in this story on the literary analysis topic of conflict. So let's write this down. Conflict for us, and when we study a story, has to do with the struggle or the fight in the story. It's an easy way to think of it. Now, technically speaking, we have two kinds of conflict. We have conflict that we would qualify as internal conflict, and we have conflict that would qualify as external conflict. Let's review all of these really quickly at, for your notes at 2B. First of all, internal conflict, although they're, they're, I'm not going to take them in the order that they are provided in your textbook. I'm going to reverse the order. Internal conflict. Here we have a character struggling with himself, herself, trying to figure out how do I feel, what do I believe, what do I need, what do I desire. These are all internal conflicts. External conflicts, that it's listed first on page 211. We have a character who will clash, compete, struggle, with an outside force. For example, we can have several of these. A, character versus character. One character going up against another character. B, we can have character versus nature. 
some kind of external force that would be a natural force, right? So for example, lost alone on the mountain, a blizzard comes in, you have to survive character versus nature. Finally, we can have character versus society or an idea. That is to say a larger number of people going up against the character. Now, of course, your textbook will point this out on page 211. This conflict or this struggle has to somehow come to its resolution. And there's often going to be, notice the word there in bold, an epiphany. Now, this is an important word. What does epiphany mean? An insight that somehow changes the character. Write that down. An epiphany is an insight that somehow changes the character, fundamentally changes the character. Now, the other thing that we're looking at on page 211 is the inferences that you're going to be challenged to make when you read these stories. Inferences, logical assumptions about information or ideas that are not directly stated in the piece of writing, okay? You're going to use the inference chart at the bottom of page 211 to help you to be able to read this story. Now, if you'll jump over to page 212, we'll make some connections here to begin our study of most dangerous games, starting, of course, with this big question, is conflict necessary? And then you've got the vocabulary listed there. Hey, you want to pay attention to those words. If those are words for you you don't know, okay, then you obviously want to be kind of uh, writing those words down and be looking for them in our study of the text. Now, let's meet our author, Richard Connell. Uh, Richard Connell's uh, dates, you've got them there, 1893 to uh, 1949. All right, let's learn a little bit about Connell, okay? He seemed destined, I'm reading with you on page 213, I hope you're reading with me. He seemed destined to become a writer. He was a sports reporter at the age of 10. At 16, he was editing his father's newspaper um, and in upstate New York. Um, Connell as well attended Harvard worked on the Daily Crimson, the Lampoon, early version of a humor magazine, National Lampoon. During World War I, Connell edited his Army Division's newspapers. In 1924, Connell published The Most Dangerous Game, so write that down. This is a story from 1924. Okay. In 1936, he settled in Beverly Hills, California. He started working as a screenwriter, twice nominated for Academy Awards. He became one of the most successful screenwriters of his day. So in other words, he liked to write stuff for movies. And then in the Do You Know box, Most Dangerous Game, the story we're about to work with, first published, it won the prestigious O. Henry Memorial Award for short fiction. So in other words, we're reading a story that is very celebrated as a famous short story. Now, there's some background here. Test for survival. As civilizations advance, I'm reading with you on 213. As civilizations advance, people no longer need to struggle for their basic survival. Nevertheless, some people still enjoy testing their bravery and physical skills in competitions. Today, computer games sometimes feature death-defying challenges. As this story shows, the sport of big game hunting once served a similar purpose. Let's get that term in our notes, big game hunting. I mean, students that are not always sure about exactly what are we talking about. Big game hunting is when an individual goes out and specifically hunts not to get food to eat. No, 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 no. Big game hunting is all about taking animals that are very difficult to take and they oftentimes will live in environments that are very dangerous to hunt them in. Okay? And most of these animals are put on a scale of some kind or another that allows for the animal to be taken to be considered a really good, now we're going to use the important word, trophy animal. You want to write that phrase down. A trophy animal. Now those of us that hunt out here, and of course we're, we're where we live in Wyoming, a lot of this happens, right? Lots of people trophy hunt. What does that mean? Well, they go out and they look for an elk, but they're not just shooting any elk. They're taking an elk that has a certain size, for example, in its both body as well as, of course, in the, in the uh, antler or the rack that's uh, involved in the animal. The idea is, again, you're taking the animal for a trophy. You're, it's competition. Let's put that in our notes. Big game hunting is almost always about competition. You're competing against yourself, you're competing against the animal, and you're competing against other hunters that have bagged similar animals. Do you got it? Okay? In our story now, we're going to hear about big game hunting. Only we're going to have this question, so write it down. What is the most difficult animal to hunt? Write that down. What is the most difficult animal to hunt? Now, by nature, you would think, 
Then, well, if you're in the ocean, probably the scariest animals there are great white sharks and maybe killer whales. And if you're on land, people would probably say things like the cats, right? Tigers or lions, these kinds of animals that are, of course, at the top of the food chain. This story is going to suggest there may be one other animal that's dangerous, that's, of course, the most difficult to hunt, and, of course, that will be a human, right? In our story, then, we're going to have very interesting contests, so let's write this down. This is a story about conflict. Huh? Now, we had different kinds of conflict that we already mentioned. I'm going to challenge you in this story to identify two things. At level one, very simply, I want you to jot down what happens. First this happens, then this happens, then this happens, so you can flow the story, so you know exactly kind of what's going on. Number two, at 2B, I'm going to ask you this question. What kinds of conflict do you see in the story? Do you find an example of internal conflict, character versus self? Do you find an example of character versus character? Do you find an example of character versus nature? Finally, do you find an example of character versus society or an idea? Now, we have the professional reader reading the story for us. We're going to follow along. Can I challenge you with this long story to conquer monkey mind? To see if you can actually follow this story all the way from the beginning to the end. It is a long story. It's not a complicated story, but it is a long story. It is going to involve, though, all of the things I just outlined in terms of conflict. Each time you see a conflict happening, jot it down so that we can pay attention to it when we come back to do our annotative reading at levels two and three. All right, here we go. Most Dangerous Game by Richard Cohn. The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell. Off there to the right, somewhere, is a large island, said Whitney. It's rather a mystery. What island is it, Rainsford asked. The old charts call it Ship Trap Island, Whitney replied. A suggestive name, isn't it? Sailors have a curious dread of the place. I don't know why, some superstition. Can't see it, remarked Rainsford trying to peer through the dank tropical night that was palpable as it pressed its thick warm blackness in upon the yacht. You've good eyes, said Whitney, with a laugh, and I've seen you pick off a moose moving in the brown fall brush at 400 yards, but even you can't see four miles or so through a moonless Caribbean night. Nor four yards, admitted Rainsford. <sighs> it's like moist black velvet. It'll be light enough in Rio, promised Whitney. We should make it in a few days. I hope the Jaguar guns have come from Purdy's. We should have some good hunting up the Amazon. Great sport hunting. The best in the world, agreed Rainsford. For the hunter, amended Whitney. Not for the Jaguar. Don't talk rot, Whitney, said Rainsford. You're a big game hunter, not a philosopher. Who cares how a Jaguar feels? Perhaps the Jaguar does, observed Whitney. Bah, they've no understanding. Even so, I rather think they understand one thing. Fear. The fear of pain and the fear of death. <laughs> Nonsense, laughed Rainsford. This hot weather is making you soft, Whitney. Be a realist. The world is made up of two classes. The hunters and the huntees. Luckily, you and I are hunters. Do you think we've passed that island yet? I can't tell in the dark. I hope so. Why, asked Rainsford. The place has a, a reputation. A bad one. Cannibals, suggested Rainsford. Hardly. Even cannibals wouldn't live in such a godforsaken place. But it's gotten into sailor lore somehow. Didn't you notice that the crew's nerves seemed a bit jumpy today? They were a bit strange, now you mention it. Even Captain Nielsen. Yes, even that tough-minded old Swede who'd go up to the devil himself and ask him for a light. Those fishy blue eyes held a look I never saw there before. All I could get out of them was, this place has an evil name among seafaring men, sir. 
And he said to me, very gravely, don't you feel anything? As if the air about us was actually poisonous. Now, you mustn't laugh when I tell you this. I did feel something like a sudden chill. There was no breeze. The sea was as flat as a plate glass window. We were drawing near the island then. What I felt was a, a mental chill, a sort of sudden dread. Pure imagination, said Rainsford. One superstitious sailor can taint the whole ship's company with his fear. Maybe. But sometimes I think sailors have an extra sense that tells them when they are in danger. Sometimes I think evil is a tangible thing with wavelengths, just as sound and light have. An evil place can, so to speak, broadcast vibrations of evil. Anyhow, I'm glad we're getting out of this zone. Well, I think I'll turn in now, Rainsford. I'm not sleepy, said Rainsford. I'm going to smoke another pipe up on the after deck. Good night then, Rainsford. See you at breakfast. Right. Good night, Whitney. There was no sound of the night as Rainsford sat there, but the muffled throb of the engine that drove the yacht swiftly through the darkness and the swish and ripple of the wash of the propeller. Rainsford, reclining in a steamer chair, indolently puffed on his favorite briar. The sensuous drowsiness of the night was on him. It's so dark, he thought, that I could sleep without closing my eyes. The night would be my eyelids. An abrupt sound startled him. Off to the right he heard it, and his ears, expert in such matters, could not be mistaken. Again he heard the sound, and again, somewhere, off in the blackness, someone had fired a gun three times. Rainsford sprang up and moved quickly to the rail, mystified. He strained his eyes in the direction from which the reports had come, but it was like trying to see through a blanket. He leaped upon the rail and balanced himself there to get greater elevation. His pipe, striking a rope, was knocked from his mouth. He lunged for it. A short, hoarse cry came from his lips as he realized he had reached too far and had lost his balance. The cry was pinched off short as the blood-warm waters of the Caribbean Sea closed over his head. He struggled up to the surface and tried to cry out, but the wash from the speeding yacht slapped him in the face, and the salt water in his open mouth made him gag and strangle. Desperately, he struck out with strong strokes after the receding lights of the yacht. But he stopped before he had swum 50 feet. A certain cool-headedness had come to him. It was not the first time he had been in a tight place. There was a chance that his cries could be heard by someone aboard the yacht. But that chance was slender and grew more slender as the yacht raced on. He wrestled himself out of some of his clothes and shouted with all his power. The lights of the yacht became faint and ever-vanishing fireflies. Then they were blotted out entirely by the night. Rainsford remembered the shots. They had come from the right, and doggedly he swam in that direction, swimming with slow, deliberate strokes, conserving his strength. For a seemingly endless time, he fought the sea. He began to count his strokes. He could do possibly a hundred more, and then Rainsford heard a sound. It came out of the darkness, a high screaming sound, the sound of an animal in an extremity of anguish and terror. He did not recognize the animal that made the sound. He did not try to. With fresh vitality, he swam toward the sound. He heard it again. Then it was cut short by another noise, 
Crisp. Staccato. Pistol shot, muttered Rainsford. Swimming on. Ten minutes of determined effort brought another sound to his ears. The most welcome he had ever heard. The muttering and growling of the sea breaking on a rocky shore. He was almost on the rocks before he saw them. On a night less calm, he would have been shattered against them. With his remaining strength, he dragged himself from the swirling waters. Jagged crags appeared to jut into the opaqueness. He forced himself upward, hand over hand. Gasping, his hands raw, he reached a flat place at the top. Dense jungle came down to the very edge of the cliffs. What perils that tangle of trees and underbrush might hold for him did not concern Rainsford just then. All he knew was that he was safe from his enemy, the sea, and that utter weariness was on him. He flung himself down at the jungle edge and tumbled headlong into the deepest sleep of his life. When he opened his eyes, he knew from the position of the sun that it was late in the afternoon. Sleep had given him new vigor. A sharp hunger was picking at him. He looked about him, almost cheerfully. Where there are pistol shots, there are men. Where there are men, there is food, he thought. But what kind of men, he wondered, in so forbidding a place? An unbroken front of snarled and ragged jungle fringed the shore. He saw no sign of a trail through the closely knit